place we're going is on the other side of that. The barrier was not meant to be crossed. If you're watching this video, you may recognize where I'm standing. I'm currently standing in the spot from Stephen King's 1989 horror classic, Pet Cemetery. And this is the spot where they built the Pet Cemetery. And back here, between the two piles of boulders, is where they built the deadfall. Now, 2024 marks the 35th anniversary of this film's release. And I've been a huge, huge fan my whole life. I saw this movie when I was really young, scared the hell out of me, and I've kind of been obsessed with it ever since. And I figured, what better way to celebrate the film's 35th anniversary in 2024 than to go back and revisit all the places where this movie was filmed. Now, I'm going to show you some things that have never been seen or documented before as filming locations for this movie. Some really exclusive first time look stuff. So I hope you'll join me. Welcome to the Ultimate Pet Cemetery Locations video. Let's get started. Now this location opens the film. So during the opening credits, the camera's kind of moving around, little tight shots, showing you all the, the stones, or I say the stones, the markers for the pets that all the local kids have, have buried. Now, this location is revisited a handful of times in the film. And I'm not gonna go completely in depth in this video, but I have done a separate video on just this spot where I line up all the angles and the shots and kind of where some of the, the graves were. Um, but just to give you a brief rundown, and you will hear me say that a few times in this video, some of the bigger locations um, I do separate in-depth videos on, which will be included in my Pet Cemetery Locations playlist on my channel. So please check those out if you want to see all the angles, all the shots for these locations. But I'm just going to give you a brief rundown here for now. So as I said, between these two piles of boulders here, right in the middle is where they built the deadfall. They brought all that fill in to create that big massive pile of, of uh, dead wood. Um, now over here to my right is where Lewis and Judd kind of start their climb up the deadfall right here. In fact, Judd actually puts his hand right on this rock here as he's climbing, starting the climb up this way. So, as I said, we see this location multiple times in the film. Now, this pile right here is one side of the deadfall. 
And then over there, of course, is the other one. I had to get a quick shot of this because this is really cool. Look at the inside of this tree. Now this is right on the left-hand pile of the deadfall. And that is really cool. It looks like a torture chamber. Now, as you can see, there were two telephone poles, basically, that propped up and held up the deadfall. This is the stump of one of them. And then this is the other end of it. Yeah, as you can see, it's it's been cut down. But that would have been the one that held up this side. And as you can see over here, this one is still very much here. It's obviously been cut, but this is the post that held up the right side. And right through there is where the pet cemetery was. Now, when they enter the pet cemetery, when Judd introduces it to them for the first time, they come through here, and this is where they would have built kind of the, the, the archway, the entryway into the pet cemetery that leads into the circle, the circular pattern of this location. And as you can see, nothing remains. It's, it's been 35 years, everything is cleared out. Some of the trees have, have grown, some have fallen down. You know, there's a lot, none of these trees, these little trees, these little pines, and um, some of these birch trees, they weren't here at the time. They've obviously grown up, which is not surprising. Um, but you can definitely tell this is where they built the circle. Now Judd brings Lewis and Rachel and, and Ellie here because they're curious to know what that path is beside their new home. And he tells them, That's a good story, a good walk. I'll take you up there sometime. And then he brings them here and shows them. Now there was a few spots over here, right on the ground right here is where you would have seen uh, the marker for Stephen King's actual pet, Smucky. You can see that in the opening credit scene and that would have been right here. There were a couple on this side as well kind of leaned right up against these stones here. Now, some of these stones have shifted a little bit. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to line them up exactly, and some of them are missing, and they're not in the same spot. So it's, it's kind of hard to do that, but just know that that's definitely where they were. And we come back here a few more times, like I said. Um, the scene where Pascal basically wakes Lewis up in the middle of the night and uh, brings him to this location to basically explain to him that the barrier was not meant to be crossed um, and that the ground beyond is sour. Um, you know, really famous, iconic lines from the film. Uh, he brings him here to explain that to him. At one point, Lewis kind of, you know, curls up in a fetal position on the ground. Um, and he's actually terrified of, of this vision he's having with Pascal. And he starts saying things like, you know, you were half dead when they found you and, you know, all that stuff. Um, so that happened right here. And there's a couple other shots, um, you know, obviously when Judd brings Lewis in to uh, bury his cat church and they start ascending the deadfall right here in this spot so yeah there's a lot of stuff that happens here really cool place but now I'm going to show you where it all begins so this is where it all begins, right here, the Creed House. 
this is where we're first introduced to Judd when the Creed family comes home for the first time to their new home they pull in right over here come into the drive now at one point Gage makes his way to the road and he's sort of saved by Judd and then we meet Judd for the first time who lives across the street right here now they built a facade over that home that's currently sitting there so that's not seen in the film but that's where Judd lived and he rescues little Gage from a speeding truck flying by the down this road introduces himself to the Creed family and thus begins a nightmare now I'm currently standing where they built the path to the pet cemetery which goes right down here and goes right around a little corner here and down at the end around this tree and you can see right here this is where they used to have that tree that the tire or yeah the tire swing was hanging from kind of right here and that's where Ellie discovers the uh, path for the first time looking down this hill And it's this very same path that Judd takes them down and shows them the location of the pet cemetery and tells the story about it. Now we see this location again when Lewis is having his, uh, he wakes up in the middle of the night to Pascal, telling him they have places to go. And they walk right down this path. And there's all mist everywhere and everything. Looks really creepy at night. But they walk right down this path, which really just rounds the corner right here and ends. And then, of course, we cut to the location in Ellsworth where the actual pet cemetery was built. But they make it seem like it's just in the woods here uh, on the edge of the property line but it's in a totally different town miles away. Now, I have covered this location in depth, in detail. Every shot, every frame from the film, inside and outside, or at least what was filmed inside. Um, <clears throat> really cool. That is an exclusive video. It's never before been seen or documented the interior of the house. Um, so please check that out. That is on my Pet Cemetery locations playlist on, here on my YouTube channel. So if you want to see everything there is here at the Creed property inside the house and out, please check out that video. I'm not going to go in depth with that here in this video. I kind of just wanted to show you where it was um, and basically explain, you know, that this is really the epicenter of the film. The, everything else that happens in the film uh, is around this location. Like, it's built around this central location. Um, a lot of it was shot here. And a lot of it takes place here. And we only, only, other, only go to a handful of other locations throughout the entirety of the film, which I am going to take you to and show you but this is kind of the main the main one you know the main spot and the biggest primary location from the entire film so after the creeds kind of get a little settled in next we come to this location Ellsworth City Hall and this is where we're introduced to the character of Pascal for the first time. 
on Lewis's first day on the job as the new doctor at the college. Now, Ellsworth City Hall kind of stands in for the university. And this is where he would have worked. And you may recognize this shot. This is where we see Pascal's body being carried in by some students. Lewis's first day on the job. So they would have carried Victor's body, the students, through these doors here. And there was a cork board up on the uh, wall there to the right. And then they would have carried him this way. And you can see those stairs in the background of this shot where Lewis and everybody that's concerned is coming. And then they go right through these double doors here. And that's right where they carried him through. It's changed quite a bit. Doesn't look at all like they made it look in the film. But this was it. Right here. I'm trying to be quiet. We don't want to interrupt any important business. Okay, so I am in Acadia National Park and I'm going to show you guys the rooted tree path um, that Lewis and Judd ascend as they're on their way to the Micmac Burial Ground. Now, this is by far the most challenging location to find. And this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is the shot. Now these are those steps. And it's taken from this angle right here. You step back, you have this tree right here. Lewis is right here. Now the other tree to the left of frame that you see in the shot is actually this stump. It's been cut down, unfortunately. However, the tree that's right behind it tends to line up perfectly with it. So you can get a pretty good idea. It still has the same look, if you will, of the trees. Obviously, it's just a little closer to frame. But this is the spot. And that is the shot kind of taken from down here. Now I've been here several times and when I came back in 2011, the rooted trees, the roots were, were all still here. They didn't have this walkway that they built to make it safer for people to pass. But as if the trees weren't enough, the only other proof that you really need that this is the spot, is that if you pan to the right, 
there are still rooted trees here. As you can see. So this is it. This is the spot. Lewis and Judd walk right up here. Now at the top of this first set of steps here, that's about where Judd would have been. You know, you kind of have to step off to the side here and come down right here if you want to get the angle and you need to get behind this tree. And then you can see the stump of the other tree over there to the left. But this is really all there is to this location. And it's a long walk and it's a lot of effort to get here. One last look. And again, the trees are behind me, but I'm just standing on the path for now. Let's take it from down low, looking up. And that's it. Okay, so. Our next location is 10 Shipwright Lane in Mount Desert Island, Maine. And this is just after Lewis and Judd ascend the rooted tree path, which is in Acadia National Park. Um, so they're kind of climbing up and you see all those roots. Well, once it cuts, we're here at this quarry, which is about a half an hour away from that path with the rooted trees. Now it's interesting the way they frame the shot because as you can see, just out of frame is a, a boat company, but you can clearly recognize that pile of rocks also sort of very famously known in Pet Cemetery. There's just something about that rock, that pile of rocks here in the quarry. Um, but we're here, we're gonna line up a few shots and see what we get. Now, as you can see, this is where Judd is kind of coming around this corner right here. You can see those cut marks and the granite. Everything still matches up. What's interesting is the discoloration on the granite right here from where the water runs down. That looks exactly the same today as it did 35 years ago. Now you can see that over here, these trees have sort of grown up, though they were not in the shot back in 1988. But it's over there that Lewis was walking. And you can kind of, let me just kind of zoom in here. And you can sort of see, if you can see this hole in the rock here, you can see that just to the left of Lewis as he's making his way this way towards where Judd was. And then of course, you know, these rocks right here, he's directly underneath these rocks right there kind of coming this way and it'd be much easier to line up and and see all in one shot if it wasn't for those trees having grown up but again you know 35 years a lot of changes it's it's amazing that this place looks pretty much the same obviously i mean it's a quarry this is granite it's not really going to change unless somebody cuts it out of here. So really the only thing that has changed is the tree growth. And then you get this shot here as uh, Judd climbs up onto this, this next rock. Amazing. It's still virtually unchanged to this day. But this is the angle right here. And here again, here's another, here's another angle on shot where Lewis is climbing up onto the rocks. 
And this one is interesting too, because, you know, again, well, there's a tree here. As you can see, it's, it's grown, was not in the shot. But if you look at this frame right here, you can see this tree still there. And then this right here has like a, well, that's a, that's a piece of granite as well, but clearly visible in that shot. And then we get this famous shot. I say famous, <laughs> famous to me, famous to Pet Cemetery fans. Um, but yeah. You get, it's actually pulled out a little bit more. Yeah, I kind of like that. Sort of hard to line it up exactly because I literally have a, a tree in my back that was not there before. But you got Lewis leaned right up against this rock here. You got Judd standing right here on the top. And he says, almost there, Lewis. And then we get uh, Lewis's POV shot where he says, You keep saying that. And that would have been basically this angle right here. Where Lewis leaned right up against this rock here. You can still see, if you match it up to the screen grab, you can still see this line in the granite still there next to Lewis's arm. And I love the way they frame this shot. I really do because you look at the angle, this is it, matching the, the frame more or less, kind of like that. But it's funny because if you just panned up just so slightly, you'd see buildings. In fact, on certain, you know, times of the day, when the sun's in a certain spot, those buildings actually reflect off the water. I've been here before when that's the case. And you have to keep the angle just right in order to miss the reflection of the buildings in the shot. So they couldn't possibly have gotten this angle, this shot any tighter than they do in the film to make it seem like it's out in the middle of nowhere. And that's basically it for the quarry scene. Um, you know, after they leave the pet cemetery and they climb up over the deadfall, uh, and they get to that rooted tree path which I'll show you in a moment. And then they come to this area and the very next shot, they walk out from around a large boulder. After the shot of Lewis saying, you keep saying that, they walk out from a very large boulder at the Micmac burial ground. And that is a totally different location, not anywhere near this quarry. So let's go check that out. Okay, so this location is one of the most famous, if not the most famous location from Pet Cemetery. The, the, the Holy Grail, if you will, the most coveted, the Micmac burial ground. Now it is a little flooded right now. But we're not going to let that stop us. We're going to get over this. The place we're going is on the other side of that. As you get to the top of the hill, off to the right, this is it. This should look very, very recognizable to you.
that's the rock right there. And Lewis and Judd come out from behind from the quarry, miles and miles and miles away. Totally different town. And where I'm standing is where the Micmac burial ground was built. Right here. Now this is a beautiful spot. This is what makes the trek totally worth it. Now, as I said, this location easily one of the most famous sought out locations from Pet Cemetery. Um, the whole backbone of what drives the narrative forward is this burial ground. What happens right here in this spot. And it is a beautiful area. I love being here. It's a little eerie being here by myself, not going to lie. But uh, we as uh, horror fans do what we need to do, right? So let's line up some shots. Now, I'm assuming I don't have to explain the scene to you. Uh, if you're watching this, I, I'm assuming you understand where this location comes into play. But just in case you don't, this is as Judd is taking Lewis to bury his daughter's cat, Church, in the Micmac burial ground. And they've gone through the pet cemetery. They've climbed over the deadfall. They have ascended the tree root path in Acadia National Park. They have climbed the quarry on Mount Desert Island. And then they walk out around this big boulder here. So this is actually the angle where they come out from around the corner of the rock. And the biggest giveaway of that is the, that big rock to the left here is clearly in the shot when they come around the corner. Plus, just the angle of the, of the big boulder. Now, if you look at the screen grab here, that I'm gonna pop up on the screen, you can see the way that the boulder angles and then that little rock down there Now you get this shot here when Lewis and Judd kind of walk up into the, uh, the, the burial ground itself, in, into the stones. You get this shot right here where Judd basically explains to Lewis that he needs to do this himself because each buries his own. And then you get this shot here as Lewis uh, attempts to dig for the first time and he swings the pickaxe and it hits solid ledge. You get this angle right here. You get a little bit of that corner, the, the rock here in the corner. You can see that body of water off to the right, the top of the frame. That is looks exactly the same today as it did back then. And you get this beautiful shot here of this location. This is this is the sunset shot where Judd's having himself a smoke while Lewis does all the work. Unfortunately, I don't have that beautiful sunset. 
but you can definitely tell this is the spot. And the boulder here, and again, there was a tree over here to the left of the boulder that has since fallen, but that little body of water that you can see back there So I think that's going to do it for the Micmac Burial Ground. Key, key, key location from Pet Cemetery. Now this house is in Brooklyn, Maine, uh, about seven or eight miles away from Sedgwick. And some of the interiors actually were filmed here. The inside of this house, namely the kitchen and the table where he's sitting with um, Lewis telling him the story about Spot, that's supposed to be the interior of Judd's house, which as you know, was a facade in Hancock, Maine across from the Creed house. So they used the interiors of this house to double as the interior of Judd's house. But this is actually Judd's childhood home, which is supposed to be the same house. And in the backyard here, um, that's where his mom would have been doing the laundry on the line. And she calls him out. And we see Spot in the sheets. So here I am at Mount Hope Cemetery in Bangor, Maine. This is 1048 State Street in Bangor. And you may recognize this spot behind me. Pretty memorable. Something about this staircase here is pretty memorable for Stephen King fans and, and Pet Cemetery because this is where Stephen King's cameo was. Missy's funeral was filmed here. Uh, Gage's grave was here. Um, I am not gonna go in depth here and cover all of this. I actually did that in a different video, a separate video, which you guys can check out on my channel. It's part of the 35th anniversary uh, video series. The cemetery, I felt like, was kind of big enough to be its own standalone video. So, I'm not going to go into that here, now. Um, but I just wanted to point out, you know, this is where Missy's funeral was filmed. Very prominent location in the movie. Just memorable, you know. Uh, Pet Cemetery fans, this is a, you know, anybody who wants to come visit the filming locations in Maine for Pet Cemetery, this is a big one. This is one that's on everybody's list and it, it's kind of a must do. And if you want to see this location in depth, including everything that happens here, Missy's funeral sequence, Gage's uh, grave, and where Lewis hops the fence to come dig him up. Check that video out in my Pet Cemetery series on my channel. Check it out. Okay, so here we are in Bangor, Maine. And the location of the Arenko truck facility, which is Cold Brook Energy in real life. These are the tanks right here that you can see when the truck is pulling out. And I've been to this location a few times. I just spent a significant amount of time talking to a guy who works here and he's been here for 19 years. And he said that the truck actually pulls out right here and goes up the hill that way. Um, 
So what's interesting about that is most people who come here and visit this location, they actually go over here and get their shot and they film towards this direction. Now that's actually not accurate, which he just informed me of. So these are the tanks seen in the background right here when the truck is pulling out. The truck pulls out right there. So it's changed quite a bit. It's changed a lot. He's, he informed me that most of what you saw in the film wasn't isn't even here anymore. This whole thing here in the front is was done. I thought he said in 1991. So it looks very similar, but it is in fact these tanks right here, and you can tell because of all the tanks in this whole facility, including that one that most people assume that it is. If you look at this one here, this one has like the little ridges on the piece that goes around the top. It's the only one that does. None of the others do, and you can clearly see that in the shot. So pretty interesting. And then another thing that was interesting that he told me about is this shop right here where I parked my truck up on this little hill. There used to be a white house there, which you can clearly see in the background when the truck pulls out and makes the corner and starts driving away. You can see the white house that sat up on this hill. He told me they had to... They basically condemned it and had to tear it down and they built this shop. So I didn't expect this, this uh, particular location to be that interesting, but that was quite fascinating. I talked to him for probably 20 minutes and he told me all about this facility, some of the history of it, how it's changed, all of those things. But this is where it starts, the beginning of one of the most horrifying and tragic scenes in, in film history, in my opinion. Okay, so next we have this spot here after the Orinco truck leaves the Coldbrook Energy Facility. This is actually in Bucksport, and he, the driver heads up over this hill here, and you can see that tower in the background of the shot. Um, the other tower, there were two, and the other one actually fell, well, they, they brought it down because I guess it was falling apart. Um, and this is interesting too, because the truck driver is coming up over this hill. He left the facility, which is actually in Bangor, or Hampton more specifically, um, and, you know, so they cut to him, from him pulling out of that lot to this shot of him coming up over this hill, which looks very different today, except for that one tower. And, uh, he's actually going in the opposite direction. He's supposed to be heading on his way towards the Creed house, which is in, uh, which is in Hancock. And that's the complete opposite direction from here. But that's going to do it for this location. It's just a very quick shot, but I figured I would get it for completionist's sake. We want to see everything, right? So this is it today in 2024. Now, this is just before the Creed House, as you can see right here. This is just before it this big open field and you may recognize this body of water this right here would have been where the creeds and and judd were having a picnic so there was a picnic table out here um, 
and it's the gauge kite flying scene. And unfortunately, the scene of Gage's untimely death. Now this is just after we see the Rinko truck leaving the Coldbrook Energy Facility in Hampton and then going up over the hill in Bucksport. And we've got the truck driver played by Donnie Green uh, cruising on his way to somewhere listening to the Ramones and uh, while he's listening to the Ramones not really paying attention and he's just kind of driving along and Gage is flying his kite and it gets away from him he kind of loses control of it and it starts blowing away and he chases it into that road the mean road right here that's eating up a lot of pets and Lewis and Rachel and Judd, they're distracted by something that Ellie says. And they're not really watching him and seeing that he's running towards the road. But of course, we know how that ends up. One of the most horrific and disturbing scenes in film history, in my opinion. And that's right here this road a Rinko truck comes right around this corner around this hill right at poor little gauge it's impossible to forget that scene it, it was really disturbing uh, still is to this day and still holds up and this movie was filmed in 1988 they did things a little differently back then I don't think we would see that level of violence involving a child uh, in a film that way today. But this location, the Creed House and the field just before it and this mean road has almost kind of become a roadside attraction in Maine, you know? Some people come down, all the way down here just to see this spot. Okay, next stop is 231 Main Street in Ellsworth, just down the road from Ellsworth City Hall. And that is St. Joseph's Catholic Church. And this is where they filmed the really intense funeral scene for Gage. And they did film inside here. So we're gonna see if we can go inside and take a look because again I do not believe anybody's ever documented this as a filming location for Pet Cemetery, and it's a big one so here we are inside the church now there isn't a whole lot to cover here in terms of different shots and angles. There's essentially really just this one kind of master shot that's taken from behind where Gage's casket would be, sort of looking out onto the entire church. Uh, and, and basically the scene is Lewis's father-in-law, Milton, is confronting him about being negligent or not paying attention when he was in the road and he kind of loses his temper and decks Lewis in the face and, and uh, we have a little bit of an issue here at this poor toddler's funeral. But this is basically the master shot here. 
Then you have this quick shot here with Judd and Ellie um, sitting in the third row back uh, pews watching what's happening. Then we get this angle here. This is kind of back to the master shot, uh, just a little bit tighter. You can see those three lights, um, well, six lights, but three on each side hanging down in the stained glass window in the back there pretty prominent in this entire sequence here in the church. And that balcony in the background is one of the most prominent and recognizable things at this location. So this is kind of a quick view from Rachel's perspective, looking towards where the casket would have been. And she's kind of seeing the action happening there. Uh, as the altercation between Milton and Lewis takes place. Now, one of the interesting things that I, I realized, I think, from being at this location is I don't believe that they actually filmed the sequence where uh, Lewis and Milton are get, get into that, that fist fight and Gage's casket gets knocked over and falls on the ground and and the lid pops open and, and Lewis gets to see uh, Gage's little hand bounce up and down and is just overcome with grief. I actually think that was done on a set. I could be wrong, but this just doesn't match up for that. Now you'll see when the casket gets knocked over, it's a very tight shot like this. And then, of course, when we see the casket actually fall to the floor uh, and, it, and it kind of bounces up and down, or the lid pops up and down, Lewis is looking at Gage's hand. Um, if you look at the background, it just doesn't match up. You have that big opening there where it looks like it was doors in the film. And I find it hard to believe they would have altered this church for that. So here it is, just one last look at the interior of this location for Gage's funeral. Like I said, uh, I don't think they filmed the casket dropping and popping open in Gage's hand. I, I just don't think they filmed that here, probably due to the nature of, of the scene and the fact that it needs to be a little more controlled. So a set would make sense. And it's also a very tight shot. So that would also make sense. But that background just simply doesn't match up uh, it has a similar aesthetic look but the angles the walls and that that opening um, what looks like doors in the film it just doesn't match up a hundred percent so I believe that was probably done on a set but this is where it would have been so that's pretty much gonna do it for the interior of the church as I said, this is a very quick scene. There's not a lot of different angles or setups to see, but very important, pivotal scene to the film. Okay, so these next two locations are a couple of the obscure ones um, that not too many people know where they are. But this here is Margie Washburn's house. Um, and this is during the flashback sequence where Judd is telling Lewis um, the Timmy Baderman story. Um, and this is a very memorable shot. I don't know why, but this one always stood out to me. And it's pretty much unchanged, even the red paint and everything. Unfortunately, this camper's in the way, but you know, you get this overhead tree here, still here today, very cool. And then you had this tree off to the left of frame here. But in the film, it, it wasn't actually this tree that's standing. As you can see, there's a stump here. And that was the actual tree that was here during the time of filming. But it's, it's pretty cool that there's still a, a tree that kind of grew up in the same spot. Because you can very well match up the shot but yeah Margie would have been doing some laundry over here 
and Timmy would have kind of been walking like a zombie up the road here. And uh, yeah, so this place is uh, pretty much completely unchanged except for that tree and that camper being in the way. She knew it was an abomination. Now, they did film the Timmy Baderman house burning scene where Judd and some other locals, you know, kind of pull up and, and try to get Timmy's father, Bill, to see reason, uh, you know, that Timmy's not himself. And they decide to basically torch the house and burn it to the ground. Well, they really did burn this house to the ground during production. They purchased a home, very cheap. I, I wanna say it was something ridiculous, like 500 bucks maybe, uh, with the sole intent to burn it to the ground for the film. Now that is right down the road here. I've been told by multiple sources, including um, Carlene Hirsch, who is the was the lead greens on the film. She confirmed that it was just down the road here from Margie's place. There's nothing there today to see, but I still want to see if I can find the exact location. So we're gonna go take a look at that now. Okay, so just down the road from Margie Washburn's house, uh, I'm currently at the site of the Baderman burn location where they burned down the Timmy Baderman residence um, where Timmy and his father Bill inside, Judd and a few of the locals decided to take matters into their own hands and... Uh, rid the world of Timmy Baderman. <clears throat> now this was just down the road from Margie Washburn's house, so it is geographically accurate to the film. Um, and <clears throat> they really did burn this house down. So this is that location. Now there's obviously nothing here to see today because they did burn the house to the ground for production um, but this is where it stood this is the edge of the road here now this location took a lot of research and a lot of talking to a lot of different people to really pinpoint exactly where this house stood because there isn't a trace left behind so I do want to give a quick shout out to Karen um, I probably would mispronounce her last name, so I'm going to omit that. But Karen, thank you for your efforts here. Uh, but this is it. This is the spot. It would have been right here in this little piece of land. It's now power lines. Um, the one telltale sign from the shot that you can tell. Let me back up here so you can see a little bit of the road is the fact that this tree right here is the tree that you see to the left of frame, to the left of the house uh, where the house would have stood. So that tree does still stand today and it was kind of in the background there, which would mean you know, the Baderman house was, you know, set back from the road, maybe 50, 60 feet. We are gonna kind of take a quick walk up in there and look, but basically, this is the frame right here. Now there were two pretty good sized trees on the right hand side right over here and I think the trees that were in the film that you see in this very quick shot are gone in fact I know they're gone now you can tell from this angle here this is where it really matches up if you look at the shot of the woman walking to the black car and you got Bill Baderman sitting in the chair out in front of the house there if you look in the background on the left, 
you can see that the tree line right here matches up and then right here the bigger tree there it was obviously fall so the leaves were orangish colored in the film but that's the angle right there and you can also see that the big tree to the right of the frame um, was obviously really close to the road, which would have put that somewhere over here. So we're gonna take a look at that now. now. I don't know how well you can see that, but there is kind of a pretty good sized mound right here. And it's hard to say if that was the remains of an old stump. It could have been the remains of that tree because it is just a little bit back from the road as you can see there so it's entirely possible and there were trees behind that and of course there are trees here and then on the other side kind of near where my truck is parked you have that quick little panning shot where you can see there's like a little shed or, or a garage type building for a, for one vehicle and it's between a cluster of trees. So the Baderman house would have been here, trees here, and then sort of over where my truck is, is where that little outbuilding would have been. Now, as I said, this was a really difficult one to, to nail down. I've actually been to this location four times now uh, doing my, my research, just kind of poking around. Um, and I've actually went all up and down the road here, basically all the way over to the driveway. That's all the way down there and up along the road, the entire way, all the way up to where my truck is parked here and all in that area over there just looking for any sign of anything and I did find a bunch of stumps I got a little confused there because I'm like you know there's there's stumps around but none of them seemed like they made sense you know matching it up to the to the screen grab um, so then I had to go back to the drawing board do more research see if I can get some more info guys that were on the fire department crew uh, that helped out when production burned the house down um, and then I spoke with Carlene who was the lead greens on the film she mentioned a staging area um, for people who wanted to watch the burn that stood across the street and at the time she said it was kind of up on a bit of a hill um, well now there's a beautiful home there but as you can see it was definitely a little hill, which would have made perfect sense. So all everything about this matches up. I've gone out and I kind of walked through the field a little bit there. And there's even some old, uh, really rusty metal cans that look very similar to the cans of gasoline that Judd and his, and his friends um, splashed all over the house when they burned it down just kind of out there in the middle of nowhere um, not too far from where the Baderman house was now I'm not saying those are the cans they could be from anywhere and they could be anything but it's possible and it's just kind of neat to to think about that so but yeah that's gonna do it for the Baderman burn location this was a big find for me because to my knowledge, uh, this is another one that I don't believe anybody has ever documented as a filming location for Pet Cemetery. Um, I know some people have, have looked for it. I don't believe anybody has found it and or confirmed that this is 100% the spot until now. So again, it's a small scene. It's a quick scene. Um, it's not... a uh, when you think about the locations from Pet Cemetery, this is not a big one that comes to mind. But I'm a completionist. I kind of like that. I kind of like the hunt 
um, trying to find all these more obscure ones because it's interesting and it's fascinating and you know this is the ultimate pet cemetery locations video so i want to make sure that i cover everything so that's going to do it for the baderman burn location off to the next one okay so here i am at the bangor international airport now they did film some scenes in here from pet cemetery notably when Rachel is on her way home towards the end of the film and she rents the Aries K with Pascal's sort of telepathic help. Um, that was filmed in here. The scene where uh, shortly after Gage's funeral where Lewis uh, is basically seeing Rachel and Ellie off to her parents house in Chicago they're flying out to Chicago and it's at that time that Lewis is gonna do some do the unthinkable by digging up Gage's body and burying him in the Micmac well during that brief scene at the airport you can see them standing next to some windows um, when Lewis is basically saying goodbye. And this is another example of a location um, that nobody's ever documented as a filming location for Pest Cemetery, but they did film here. So they have since remodeled the airport. I don't know how long ago this was, but obviously they filmed in 1988. It's gonna look a lot different but I'm gonna see if I can pinpoint exactly where that spot was, where the gate was or would have been, um, where those windows were. There's another shot where um, Rachel is trying to get on the flight back to Maine and she comes running up to the gate and she's like, I gotta get on this flight. And, and uh, the woman behind the counter is like, you know, the, the, the gate's closed and, and she says, and she just takes off running down the jet bridge and she says, okay, 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 I'll call the pilot. Um, that may have been here. I'm not 100% sure whether that particular shot, which I'll show you right here, I don't know if this was a set or not. I'm not 100% convinced that it matches up the look of the rest of the airport that I do know was filmed here. So this shot possibly could have been set. But we're here. We're going to check it out. We're going to confirm it one way or the other. So here it is. This is the interior of the Bangor International Airport. And these windows here, this is just to the left of gate three. Uh, and these windows overlook the parking lot outside. Now this is the space where all of the action happens here at the airport where uh, Lewis is seeing Rachel and Ellie off to uh, Rachel's parents. They're headed to Chicago. Um, and Lewis is basically going to stay behind and, and uh, you know, well, we know <laughs> what Lewis does when he stays behind. Uh, but, but there's a handful of, of shots here. They all take place right in front of this window, that this group of windows. Now, the airport has been changed. It's been remodeled at some point since filming took place in 1988. I am not 100% sure when those renovations and changes took place but this is definitely the spot this is the area and you know that because if you look out the windows behind the actors in the scene now granted it's kind of hard to make out and most people don't look at this kind of thing when they're watching the film but if you did um, you would see that out the windows they're kind of overlooking a little parking lot.
Now I have been all over this airport and this is the only spot in the entire airport where there are windows like this that overlook a parking lot. And there are a couple of telltale signs that this is the spot. For instance, you have the two light poles out there. You can clearly see those in the shot if you kind of zoom into it. You can see the light poles. These are the light posts for the parking lot area. Um, and then you can also see that blue exit sign in the way in the background there in the shot where Ellie's talking to her grandmother, you can see a little blue square down in the left-hand corner. Well, that is that sign. So still very much there today. Now that isn't the original sign, I'm sure. The sign has changed. It may, even move, may have moved back or forward a few feet, but it's in the same place that it was during filming. Um, there's also a building you can see out there in the back that has like, it almost looks like a, a bunch of roll up doors. I don't know if it's a hangar or what it is, but you can see that in the background of some of these shots as well. Now the trees have really grown up in this space. If you look at the screenshots, you can see that in 1988, they were just very small bushes and you could clearly see the buildings in the background in the shot. Well, those buildings are still there. They just happen to be shrouded by trees. Um, so it's really difficult to make it out 100%, but I am gonna go outside and hopefully get a bit of a closer look so you can see a little better. But that is uh, where it took place. These are the windows. This is the space. This is the gate just to the left of uh, gate three. And as I said, nobody's ever confirmed this spot as a filming location until now. But this is definitely it inside the Bangor Airport. Now we do come back to this spot um, in a later scene, at which point I'll take you outside. So after Gage's horrific funeral scene, Lewis sends Rachel and Ellie to her parents' house in Chicago, and he's going to stay behind and take care of some things. And apparently one of those things is to dig up poor little Gage's body and bury him up in the Micmac burial ground. And see, he wants to bring his son back, obviously. And that's kind of the, the, the story of Pet Cemetery in general is how far would you be willing to go to bring back someone you love that has died? And uh, obviously, that's never a good idea. But the thought crosses Lewis's mind, and he decides to give it a shot. And when he does, he sneaks into the cemetery at night. And when he does that, he parks right here on the other side of this fence. You can see that telephone pole behind him. And you may recognize this stone and that tree. Right to the right of that tree is where Gage's tombstone was. Now, I covered this location in depth in a separate video, so I'm not going to do that here and now, but I just wanted to point out that this was that spot. Okay, so this is the Bellevue Mansion. This is Rachel Creed's childhood home and where her parents uh, still live in Chicago. This is actually in Hancock County, Maine. Um, but in the film, it's Chicago. Now, I only had a limited amount of time here uh, to, to uh, visit the inside of the Bellevue. And the owners were home at the time, so I am doing a voiceover narration for this. Basically to try to be as minimally invasive as possible to their personal space and respect their time. Now, this shot here is probably the most recognizable shot of 
the Bellevue Mansion um, at Rachel Creed's childhood home. And, and we have this image of Rachel as a young girl who is um, essentially tasked with caring for her sister, Zelda, who has uh, suffers from spinal meningitis and is uh, essentially dying in the other room. And um, Rachel, as a child, was left alone to care for her on multiple occasions. And that experience haunts her to this day. Now, this next sequence of shots is the second floor of the Bellevue. So if you go up that beautiful staircase, you're going to be in this hallway. You go to the end of the hall, it's going to bring you into this master bedroom. This was not seen in the film, obviously, but you can see that fireplace and that archway through the doorway in some of the shots. Now, I did want to stress that this was an arranged meeting between myself and the homeowner. Um, it took a lot of pieces being put into place and, and communication to try to set this up. This is not an easy thing to do, so I certainly do not recommend rolling up on this property. It, it, it does not work like that here. This was an arranged and agreed upon specifically for this video. So I could bring you guys uh, an inside look of this location that no one else has seen or documented um, before. And she was kind enough to allow me to do that for the 35th anniversary. And that's, that's really why this is happening. So again, this is just more uh, footage of the upstairs here, this hallway, the staircase, um, of course, where we see Rachel running around the, uh, the staircase here up at the top of the stairs. We've got the door here. That is Zelda's bedroom. Um, and there continues to be a lot of speculation to this day about whether they actually filmed the Zelda scenes, the bedroom scenes, on location here at the Bellevue or if that was on a soundstage at the Bangor Armory. That is still up for debate. And I've even spoken with uh, the actor who played Zelda uh, himself, Andrew Vatsik, and even he could not recall exactly where it was filmed. And I did actually go inside this room. Um, it was occupied at the time, so I didn't want to spend that much time in here. But I can tell you that it is completely unrecognizable if they did indeed film in there. So now we just kind of move down the hallway here. We're going to go back downstairs. And I did want to say that the, all the, the, the shots of... Rachel's parents' house are interiors. There are no exteriors of this location. So, you know, she comes to the banister. You know, this is where she's 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 on her way to head home. She knows that something's wrong. Um, and then of course, as she comes down the stairs, this is this is young Rachel um, after Zelda has died. <clears throat> And she comes down the stairs and you can see the kids standing in that open doorway down there. Um, and she says, you know, Zelda's dead, Zelda's dead. Um, and she kind of goes running outside. And then as you continue on down the hall, you come to a living room area. And this is where we get, you know, the, the shot of, of Ellie on the phone with... Lewis and he's he's still back home and that's the whole you want to talk to Gage scene and then we get this shot of Rachel when she's on the phone with Judd and in that famous painting in the background uh, which foreshadows uh, Gage in his little purple suit that we see uh, later on when she gets home and that's going to do it for the Bellevue Mansion. That is basically everything that they filmed inside this property for Rachel Creed's parents' house. Okay, so we're back at the airport now. And this is where Rachel is trying to get back home because she knows that Lewis is about to do something bad. And we have her... Uh, going up the escalator here 
Now during the remodel, they obviously changed some of these things, but the escalator is still in the same spot and everything for the most part looks the same. Now you can see on the sides of the escalators, what used to be wooden slats is now glass, but it's, you can definitely tell it's the same space. Now going down the escalator, which does not happen in the film, but I wanted to go down the escalator and show you that there used to only be one escalator going up to the terminals in the film. And on the left-hand side of that, was a, a, a wide stair staircase. And they have since changed that and added a down escalator and cut the stairs in half. So you basically have about half of the stair space that existed uh, during the filming. And obviously these are not the same steps from filming. They replaced that kind of wood look with this sort of rubber matting. So, this is a view from outside. I'm outside the airport, just getting a ground level view that's a little more clear because this is the section that you can see outside the windows. Um, I don't know if you can, yeah. So if you look over there, the windows are on this side over here. You can't see them from this angle but they're looking out over this part of the lot and you can see these two poles in the shot and you can see that blue sign way down there in the background obviously it's probably not the same sign but and then behind these trees you can see those buildings. You see those openings right there? I'm not sure if those are hangers or what that is. But you can see that in the shot. If you look out the window in the background of this shot, you can see that building. These trees have really grown up, so they've kind of blocked the view. But that's it. And you can also kind of see that curve, the curve in the road. This is the exit of the airport. But I just figured I would come down here and, and get a little bit of that footage. That's kind of hard to see through the window. There's a glare on the window up in the location, but this is it. Confirmed. So this is another angle here from across the street. This is the outside of the airport. These windows right here, those are the windows that Lewis, Rachel, and Ellie are in front of. And if you look out those windows, you know, beyond the actors and the scene, you look out the windows, that, this is the, what they're looking at, is this lot right here. So, after years and years of speculation about where that was, that's it. Right in there. And this is on the exit side of the airport. So you would you enter the airport, and you're gonna come in around there, go inside here well when you come out baggage claim is down there and that is up next to gate number three so I just wanted to come a little closer and see if I could get a better look at the, this building across the street from the airport it's not very clear but like I said, that is the building that you see outside the windows in the way background. All these trees here have grown up. All these pines, they were tiny in the filming. 
And way over there, that's the airport. And these are the windows right here. Right in the middle of those two light bulbs. Very cool. Uh, this building here is also in the shot where you see Ellie talking to her grandmother just before they board the plane. You can see this building in the shot as well. And then of course, the one over here that is shrouded by the trees, that's the one that has all those openings, the green, green doors. Might be a hangar for planes, I'm not sure. I can't really get a good clear view of it. And then this is the blue sign that you see outside in that shot as well. If you look closely. So the last location that takes place here at the airport is when Rachel uh, and Pascal actually helps her to rent the uh, scratched Aries K. And that was in this general area. Nothing to match up, but it was definitely here. Now, the reason that I believe it was this spot is you can see that it's kind of on the other side of Pascal, you can see that it's kind of up against a wall. So it's definitely in a corner. And this is the only corner spot at this rental car location in the airport. Now, one other shot you get here is this shot. Now, this is after Lewis, this is after Gage has died and Lewis comes back on his own to try to bury Gage up here. So we get this shot of him by himself at night with a flashlight. And again, this tree is kind of in the way of the, of the shot. But just on the other side of the tree there, down here, that's where Lewis is kind of stepping up coming back up here and then when he hears the sound of it's a bunch of creepy sounds maybe somebody even saying his name Lewis you know um, we get a tight shot of him kind of cradling gauge flashlight in hand and you can see the rocks here in the background all blurry and then he takes another look right over here he turns around to look at it and you kind of get this shot here yeah like that and that is when we get this the face pops out of those rocks very odd odd scene that's one of those that you know I always kind of wondered if this was an afterthought if they decided to do this later on um, or if it, it they wrote it in the script and it was always this way I know it is part of the story um, but some things changed I uh, know this is a topic of debate as well about whose face it is that pops out of these rocks here and kind of comes up like that. Um, I think it's Judd. I think it's Judd's face. For a long time, I thought it was Lewis's father-in-law because, you know, he had the, the fight, the altercation with his father-in-law. Um, and there's just something about the way it says Lewis and all that made me think that that's who it was supposed to be. But the more I watch the film, the more I believe it's Judd and it's foreshadowing uh, what Gage is going to do to Judd. It's Judd's face. And if you study this face, you can see the mouth looks a little messed up, which it would be because he's about to take a scalpel to the face. This is where Rachel's drive home begins. She comes down this little ridge here. This little 
little rise in the road. Just coming down and the camera kind of follows her like this and you get a pan shot sort of like that comes to that tree and then it cuts to where she gets a flat tire. So Rachel's driving down the road. We get a little pan. So this is where Rachel comes careening around the corner here. You can see these two power poles. You can see the Junction 15 sign. And you can definitely see that big boulder to the right of the sign. And also this one here off to the left. And it's a night shot, but you can also see all of those rocks, those boulders up in the background there. That's kind of the angle, sort of. She comes careening around this corner. And then ends up getting a flat tire and going off the road. And she's kind of like facing into a swamp. Well, that swamp is right here. Now, a lot has changed here as well. I mean, the swamp basically looks the same. But a lot of the dead trees that were kind of out there have fallen down. Now you can see, you can still see plenty of trees, but they're not as tall as they once were. Kind of fallen down. But this is where she would have gone off the road and kind of nosedived into the swamp. And again, like I said, there's there's no way to pinpoint exactly where her car may have gone off. If I had to guess, I am thinking, because this is the flattest portion of it right here, I have a tendency to think that it was probably right around here. You know, the land has kind of dips down, as you can see. I've got this little tree here. So, no way of knowing for sure exactly where the car is, though it would have been. There's, there's no telltale sign of that. A lot of the trees that were once out here, I mean, you can even see, you know, you know, like they've fallen down. So, but you can definitely tell this is the same spot. There was some tall grass here. If you look at this grass, I mean, this is March. So the weather is different. There's no green growth here. But you can tell just by looking at the type of grass that this is, that that's the grass that Rachel is standing in next to the car. And when she leaves this spot, she starts walking, which brings us to the next spot. Okay, so here it is. This is the location of George's diner. And I was really, all right, a lot of traffic on this road. Um, really excited about this location because this is one that nobody has really confirmed and it has changed a lot and it's really grown up but it's a quick shot where Rachel gets picked up you can tell this is the spot because of these trees so you have these two trees to the left of frame and then you have this big tree here. 
And then further down the road, you can see that sign right there. Now that's probably not the same sign and it's probably moved slightly. I mean, we're talking 35 years here, but this is definitely without question the spot. And the Arinko truck would have driven right down this road like this. Apologize for the wind. And Rachel would have been just on the other side of this tree here. And you can see, you know, it was a bit of a horseshoe shape up into the diner where the diner sat, which was a little further back. Let's see if we can take a closer look. I'm actually gonna go over there, kind of into the woods a little bit and see if I can find anything that might remain. From another angle here, these are those trees right there to the left of that sign. And if you walk directly across, you can see there's kind of a clear opening here, which I believe would have been kind of like the other side of the U shape that went up in, because it's a little more clear. So let's see what we can find. I spoke with the daughter of the owner of the diner, George himself. She confirmed that this was indeed the exact spot where it used to be um, and she said it used to be all blueberry fields back up in there which again impossible to tell today this is 35 years later but all blueberry fields and they took the diner out in 1990 which was a year or so after the film came out and then this land just kind of sat empty and nobody did anything to it. And so, you know, it grew up. She said the blueberry fields kind of took over the hill almost all the way down to the road here. And so you can't, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically unrecognizable today. If it wasn't for those trees, you would never know that this was the spot. The trees and the sign. Now I have found some actual confirmation uh, that this was the spot. Let's check this out. This is the power pole. And if you look in the screenshot to the left of the frame, which I will show you right here, you can see there was a power pole there with a light on it. And this is that power pole, which would mean that the diner was most likely right over here that's where it would have sat now somebody has since purchased this land and you can see it through the trees there and there's a driveway that goes up in um, and that's their property and i'm not i'm not going to go up there but i am, am blown away by this the pole is still here and you can clearly see it in the shot. Again, it's a very quick shot, so it's easy to miss. But if you're studying that shot like I have over the past several weeks, you notice that light pole. And this is it. Still here. Wow. And it gets better. There were picnic tables at the diner in the shot up in the background next to the diner itself to the right and check this out
that is the remnants of an old picnic table. This is so cool. Picnic table, remnants of the old picnic table from that diner scene in Pet Cemetery 35 years later. And that is still here in the woods. The power pole that you can clearly see in the background of that shot where Rachel gets picked up by the Arenko truck driver. And this is so mind blowing to me. And you know, when I was doing my research and I pinpointed that this was the location, I was thinking to myself, man, I really hope, I know it's all overgrown now with a lot of trees, but I really hope that that power pole is still there. And here it is. Proof, undisputable proof. This is the spot. Now, if you walk a little further up in here, there's the power pole that was here in the woods. More boulders. And more specifically, you can clearly tell blueberry fields. This was the place. So these are the trees right here, yet again. Now, as you can see here, all the bark, this tree is basically dead. All the bark has come off. And you can see down here at the bottom where it looks the same as this other tree. One more shot of this before we leave this location. And again, this is the corner of Mines Road and Snow's Cove Road. So this is uh, corner of Route 15 and 176. So you just come to this intersection. It's right here on the left. Now I also thought this would be the perfect spot to end this video because the ending of the film does take place here. It wasn't actually filmed here, that famous kitchen scene that was actually filmed later on on a, a set that they rebuilt kind of the interior of the kitchen uh, after production had already left the state of Maine. So they didn't film that in here, but because the ending takes place here at the Creed House, I thought, this would be a perfect place to, uh, to say goodbye. So thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this. And for those folks who can't get to Maine, um, maybe they live way out of state, out of the country, whatever. Big Pet Cemetery fans like I am. I hope this uh, brought you a little something and you, and you get to enjoy seeing all of these spots. So thank you guys. We'll catch you in the next one.